All right. So good. All right. So, hey, everybody. I got my very good friend, uh, Simone, with us today. She's going to be talking about some of her projects she's working on. And I think I met you. You had taken a class over at CGMA maybe two or three years ago now. Is that correct? Wow, is it already that long ago? But yeah, that it, sounds correct. It, it might be because I know it's been a while. And mm -hmm. like what I do with like a lot of the people that run through my courses, the case I love to follow and get engagement with everybody, uh, as, as many people that come through it again because it's it's so cool to keep up with people to see where people go, what you know in this case today what they've worked on, and see where where it's at. So what have you been doing in the last uh, you know three three or so years? Have you been working on any fun projects? I see, and I'm gonna show everybody you, you got you got YouTube's going. You you're very active on the social medias like Instagram and constantly posting on art station but uh yeah what what kind of projects you've been working on anything fun yeah definitely so after the um architecture course that i did with you that kind of sparked my interest for environments so i kind of went down that road and um did some freelancing work and just kind of yeah i've been working on some fun projects and have come to terms now with like hey i'm an environment artist and i love creating these worlds and these spaces and that kind of got me into world building and art direction for smaller indie game projects so that all kind of yeah worked out and i'm doing a lot of fun stuff now yeah your work's got a great sense of character to it there it always has a, a life of its own I, and i've always saw that and i and i really admire that you, you you and you work on a lot of these smaller little projects and i think is that was that the focus uh or that that's what kind of inspired your youtube channel is that you have a lot of subjects and cover lots of game jam sort of mm -hmm. uh, videos and stuff. I don't see a lot of that. So that again, that was a very fresh take for me. Yeah, I just, um, so the past two years, I just gave myself some downtime. Um, I've moved to Sweden and have been living in a game dev collective, basically. So it's a co-working, co-living space. And I just took those, yes. Um, and I just took those two years to just do my own thing and test a bunch of things out. So the first year I just did like random YouTube videos about art, about taking art courses, but also about like game jams or traveling or going to conferences. And I just tried all these different topics. And then with the game jam videos, I discovered that nobody was doing them and people reacted very positively to them. And I really like making those. So, so in, in, a, in, in a quick e essence, like for someone that's not quite aware of the game jam scene or what even that yeah. may is, how, how would you sum that up? Um, a game jam is basically when you and a bunch of people, like a small team, maybe two or three people get together frame like maybe 24 hours to make a small game or just a prototype. So the theme can be anything. It can be a story. It can be just one word and you're... Uh, the challenge is to interpret that and make something playable. Oh, that's um, awesome. Uh, yeah. So do you, do you do that fairly regularly then, or is it like something that's scheduled once a week? How does the structure of that sort of work? I'd love to do it more. I mostly do the big ones like Ludum Dara or Global Game Jam. So there's actually a lot of game jams being organized online where a lot of people get together. They all do the game jam at the same time. They all do the same theme. So it's kind of like a whole community that I've slowly grown into. And That's awesome. Yeah, I wish I did them more regularly, but then I still, yeah. And so <laughs> like every, everybody <laughs> just kind of contributes their, their specialties or their expertise toward mm -hmm. the goal of making a game. Somebody comes up with an idea and then everybody just kind of runs on board with it, right? And they're, they're a very quick turnaround. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the cool thing. Like when you, everybody that's been um, working in game development with huger projects, usually as an artist, you maybe only get to work on a smaller part of the game or like you're designing all the houses, you're designing maybe the character's clothing. But with the game jam, if you're the only artist, you have to do everything or you yeah, have to find everything. a way to do animations or like if there's no game designer, then your idea maybe gets made. Um, or you can even switch around and learn some programming. So a game jam is just like no risk and just having fun. And I kind of like that side of game development. I like it's that so different. too. So 
is it not as stressful as it may sound, right? Because you're, you're emphasizing the fun. It's not like a big deal if it doesn't quite work out. So that th th therefore, it wouldn't be as stressful, or would it be? Mm, I think it depends on your personality because, like, I've done a couple of them. So now I'm like, okay, if this game jam doesn't work out, then it's gonna be over in 24 hours, and I'm still learning something along the way and still doing something together with my friends. But if you're the type of person that's like, I need this for my game dev portfolio, this is going to be like one more piece that is going to get me a job. Or if you think about it like that, then maybe it's going to be more stressful. Well, that's awesome. So it, it seems like you've been keeping uh, plenty busy and kind of fell into your own little niche then. Yeah, kind of. That's, that's awesome. And as, as we were talking the other day, the, the reason I wanted to get you on today to talk kind of about kind of just the, the idea and the scope of these mini projects and what had caught my eye, which apparently was catching a lot of people's eyes. I've seen lots of places running articles on your little project here is that you're kind of in a sense, just like redesigning a lot of the old Pokemon locations in like these fully kind of realized kind of very colorful illustrations. Uh, mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk to you a bit, a bit uh, about this series, right? Is that, that's what it is. It's kind of like a series for you. Yeah. It kind of morphed into that. Like it just, I just started it with these first two images and then it kind of became a series. And yeah, that's what it is now. <laughs> so it wasn't anything that was, you know, like overly thought out prior, right? It's oh, just, no. <laughs> <laughs> you caught some wind and you're running with it. Mm -hmm. well, that's awesome. So did, did anything prompt you specifically to pick, was it like a certain game in the series? Was it a certain memory or event that that you've experienced maybe like when you were younger that really you know was the drive behind this um so actually this whole project started with a friend of mine wanting to do a challenge of just doing 150 studies of just dropping yourself into google street view and just painting what you see um and i've always because of anime and manga, but also the whole culture have had a fascination with Japan. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to paint 150 locations from Japan. And as I was wa walking around there on, like, I, I think I did like 60 of them. And like after 60, I got really, really bored with doing the same thing over and over. Um, so you had gone 60 days on this challenge before you even kind of shifted gears. Yeah. With it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, but then I got bored, so I thought, might as well draw Pokemon in there. And then I remembered that, I think on a site called Bulbapedia, um, they mapped the region from the first game onto the real-life region of Kanto in Japan. So the cities actually, like, the cities in the game have a correlation with real cities in real Japan. So I get curious. I went. I opened Google Maps and I dropped myself into these cities and walked around. And then I kind of got the idea: how cool would it be to take these real-life locations, um, yeah, and paint them like they would be in the game? And I think what sparked that interest is because in the games, especially in the first ones, there's not really a lot of feedback on how the world around you looks. Like a tree is just a couple of pixels and it looks like a standard tree. But then when I was walking around in one of these areas, it looked super tropical. And that kind of helped me see this whole mess of pixels that Pokemon 1 was with new eyes. And like that kind of sparked this whole thing. Yeah, this body of work is, I mean, the, the colors are on point. They're they are very vibrant, very lively. And, you know, I, what was it? The originals were released on the little Game Boy screen. I think it was only, it was only like black and green, right? Like it was very mm -hmm. binary in terms of what they could present. Yeah, back then I played the Game Boy Color version and I think that had, was it 16? It had a couple more colors. So like every town you would walk into, the palette would swap. Um, and that is still a bit stuck in my mind because right now when I'm painting one of the towns, I'm like, oh, this is the orange town or so, so I better put some orange in there. <laughs> and you, you know what works for Star Wars? They just theme every planet with a very one specific climate. You know, you could break that down. Okay, every town's got its own color. And I, I've always liked that, that way of 
people like when they're taking the classes are like how do you design an entire cityscape well cityscapes as you've probably read they're very organic they're made by hundreds of people architect over hundreds of years but like when we we make these game towns we make these towns and cities for movies it's it's not as much fun to portray them as they realistically are right like it is very much fun to find a theme or find a motif in many cases and just play that up exponentially and it, it creates again it, it adds the design restrictions to to whatever you're working on and it makes things kind of pop and of course stand out Mm hmm yeah definitely yeah so these are these are really cool and I, how how much uh time you know are you putting toward these i guess what every day you're doing them um so in the beginning, I limited everything to one hour. And I think the one that you have open right now, that was one of the first ones where I went over that one hour limit. And I think this was one and a half or two. Um, so I would say roughly most of them are two hours. And I usually try to, um, when I was, so these I did when I was still living in Sweden. Um, and there I would get up early in the morning, go down to the office and then start working on these. And then once my partner got up and came down to the office, we started working. So I knew I had to get them done before he got up. So that was kind of the time limit that I set myself because like you can just like spend hours detailing. But for me, because those in the beginning that there, there was still studies the purpose was to like measure and figure out proportions and like get the angles right and only then paint in pokemon and play with the colors um and i would say with the newest ones they take about three hours because the cityscapes like the the big pokemon cities that i'm drawing now they have a lot of detail they have a lot of buildings um so i would say they these take around three hours but that's also why i'm uh i can't do them daily at the moment because there's just i'm moving so there's too much going on but like all these that you're scrolling through at the moment those were daily ones and yep. i want to get back to that definitely life life tends to get in the way and interrupt mm -hmm. many many things yeah but i think that's that's okay like when you start a daily project um it if you can do it every day and you kind of fall into a routine, that's great. But then don't be discouraged, I guess, if you can't do it four days in a row. Then, like, I've made the experience that most people then just stop because, oh, no, they've broken their streak. But no, you can just start again and, like, get a streak going. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, consistency and persistence the key, I would say, mm -hmm. for something probably like that. Now, you, you these are all kind of inspired and based in, in the Kanto region. Have you ever personally got to travel to Japan to check out any kind of environment like this? No, but I would love to. It's, like, on, it's on the to-do list? The, the painting all these cities now, like, just the way that, like, just me walking around on Google Maps and looking at all these things, like, that's just made me want to go even more. Well, I, I definitely hope uh, you, you get to fulfill that because I, I bet it would be quite a surreal experience, you know, actually being there. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like also now the, the latest paintings that I did were from um, mostly from the Tokyo area. And I think like I'm a bit obsessed with Tokyo and that the way that city works. It's just like the yeah the way um how the whole traffic system work how big it is how there are these super tiny buildings next to huge buildings so yeah <laughs> that's definitely on the list so with these you're essentially taking these little top-down isometric very limited in terms of you know, the technicals like you're taking these locations and you are bringing them to life what are you finding to be the hardest challenge or the hardest aspect of kind of doing this sort of translation hmm i would say the hardest part is finding the reference actually because as you just said like i'm taking these isometric or just a bunch of pixels um and then trying to find a real life image um that is close to what the reference looks like yeah there for example um so the process for finding the reference is probably the most challenging because first i have to figure out which part 
of the real life region corresponds to the fictional town. Then I drop myself into that, yeah, into Google Maps and just walk around and try to find a place that looks like it could fit um, with what's in the game. And then I think as soon as I have the reference, I get all these ideas and then just translating that into one of the images is just the fun part. It's like they always add the Pokemon at the end because that's the most fun part. But yeah, the beginning is actually the hardest step. I, yeah, and I think that usually is the case for most people. It's like where to start, what's what's going to be the foundation here. Mm -hmm. So what have you learned anything new throughout you know this whole project and this experience of doing this? A bunch of things. Where to even start? Um, so before, like. I'm, I learned to appreciate references even more now. Like you kind of started it three years ago or two years ago with the course. Um, before that, I rarely used references. And now, like for me, references have become everything. Um, and that project just made me appreciate them even more. Yeah, yeah um, what you're doing is you're really combining two completely separate. You know, you're taking an inspiration and you're almost like marrying it with a great reference and what art comes out of that that's how you're interpreting both of mm -hmm. those so there's a really nice synergy going on here because you could give the same two references you know to to somebody else and they could interpret it entirely differently so i think that's where the real the real beauty of it is mm -hmm. and then also i think why i started this whole um project in the first place because i've always been overly obsessed with colors um, and like I never bothered to sit down and learn to paint reality so uh, with doing 60 of these before I did the Pokemon ones I had to do 60 where I just tried to get the colors from real life like I, I didn't do color picking I just went into the color mixer like even now with the Pokemon ones, I try to still get the original colors and then I have a bunch of filters at the end which push the colors even more. Yeah, um, I'm seeing like here, I, even at this stage, which I think was more of your, your middle stages and the steps yeah. you said, you've already done a good amount of interpreting and you've added a little bit of uh, you know color variety to something that photographs always just tend to flatten you know, reality in a way. And anybody who's ever taken a picture of a place and then, or and has been there on purpose, they come back home later, look at it, like, no, that's not quite as I remember it. Mm -hmm. it photos is, and, and that's, I think, a problem a lot of people have that are referencing really well, is that they tend to forget you know, that it's just a reference. It's not anything you have to be, like, completely damned to. Like, you can, mm -hmm. you want to express kind of what's there and what's the best way to express that. And I think that's that's really where a lot of your life is coming in your paintings. Like, this last step right here, it's like, ooh, you know, it just got slapped in the face with some color and it absolutely mm -hmm. makes it pop. Yeah, but, like, I've learned to appreciate gray so much more now because, like, I realized, okay, if I paint the sky super blue, but then I want to brighten up the whole thing or put some more um, contrast in there, then that sky is just going to be like all blue and it will look like shit. Um, but like if you put a little gray into everything and balance it properly, then yeah, you can use all sorts of filters or add light or add more contrast and it will still look good. Ne neutrals um, is the name of the game. And I think yeah. that if we're talking straight color theory, it's probably like the, the hardest sub aspect of all of that for, for people to really grasp and master because it's it's just too easy to get a, a gray or a neutral to look like mud or flat but once you can understand the like the language of how colors interact with each other then mm -hmm. you can get you know really subtle uh, beautiful you know moments from from a neutral mm -hmm. do you have a favorite image and out of the whole set so far is there one that sticks out to you? Like, yeah, this, this is like going to be the cover when I do a book of all of this. Hmm, I think it would either have to be... I think it's one of the more recent ones. Um, there was... Yeah. Um, scroll down a bit. It's either the cafe one. Um, two to the right. Ah, you're lagging behind it. Yep, either that one or then two to the right and one down that has the cityscape. 
Yeah, I, l I love how the shadows came out on one of the buildings. Um, so yeah, I think either that one or the other one, just because I like the moods and like how the colors came out in the end. And what is also super interesting is because you already said if you make a book at the end, I never thought about that, but then somebody was writing a comment saying exactly that. And then I was like, oh my God, now I have a goal in mind. Um, and that is so motivating if you're doing dailies. Um, so yeah. Slap them together, put them in it, put them between two thicker pieces of paper, make a yeah. book. I was that thinking would be so awesome in the end, and you can just see like, oh my god, I just did this thing that I can hold in my hands now. This one's one of my favorites. Maybe if I had to put my finger on a favorite, I I was drawn to this one when I was looking through. I I love like tucking nice little quaint places underneath large industrial uh, overpasses mm -hmm. and then to kind of contradict this this sternness and the straightness with all this with all these like whimsical playful brush strokes that you have in the clouds in the sky mm -hmm. I, I just love every, every bit of the contrast that this scene kind of represents and you know having the little guy just kind of chilling out outside that you know everything's got its little place in here which is really quite nice oh thank you yeah, with, with this one also, when I found the reference, I was like, oh my god, this is so cool. How can I use this? <laughs> there was actually the other way around because I found that bridge and I was like, I need to use this somehow. And then I figured, oh, there's a town where pros pros uh, possibly in the future a train line is going to run through. Yes, I can use this. <laughs> Yeah, I can only imagine spending that much time on, on Google Earth there, uh, finding a lot of other places and not even knowing, like, I got to use this, but I, I have just no idea how yet, how that's going to play into things. Yeah. So um, do you have any tips today that you could pass on to anybody else? Maybe we already said some that, you know, are struggling to do, you know, a bit more of a long-term commitment or even like a bit of a long-term project. Mm. So I would say step number one is obviously just start. Um, but then I think if you're doing dailies for the first time, I would say start with something really, really small. Um, because I think if that would have been my first daily project, I wouldn't have gotten as far. Um, I actually did a last year. I wanted to get into figure drawing. So I just did 10 minutes of figure drawing every day after waking up. And that just build that habit of like just doing it because even if I didn't want to do it sometimes like I opened my PC and the first page was actually quick poses and then I thought okay it's only gonna be 10 minutes and then afterwards I was super happy that I did it and I started my day very positively um, yeah so I would say start with something that you can do in 10 to 20 minutes to just build that habit and once you have that that small spark of success when you look back after a project and you've been doing it for one and two months and you look back and you see how much you did then you kind of want to do another one because then you're hooked um and i think that's the only reason why i started this other one in the first place when my uh my buddy said hey do you want to do 150 google earth painting <laughs> So yeah, that could be a tip in itself is, you know, in terms of accountability, you know, like, like going into the gym, you go in with a buddy, you know, oh, use yeah. a little buddy system. So, so people will hold you uh, accountable for it as well. Oh yeah. No, like when we started this together, it was great. We, um, we have a discord where a bunch of, I think we're seven, around seven people. We're a bunch of friends. We know one another from art events. And when him and me started doing that together, like every day, he would post his drawings. So I was like, okay, I got to do mine. Then I posted mine. Then the other artists on that server were like, oh, we're not going to join you. But we also did things. Here, look at this sketch. Look at this. So that kind of motivated everyone every turn. Um, the community so, yeah. building can go a long way. Oh, yeah. Definitely. No, definitely. And I think that's the same, too, on a slightly unrelated note, but very similar, why a lot of you know, nutritionists will say, and not necessarily diets aren't the key to weight loss. Diets aren't the key to, to like, that's why they don't work, because it's more about building a habit. A habit is going to work long term, where a diet is innately set up to run as a very temporary measure, almost like a Band-Aid to a larger problem. Definitely. I think that's why it's also 
good to start with just a small change in your life, like just do something for 20 minutes every day. And then within a year, you'll be such a better artist than you were the year before. And for me, that it took me so long to realize that. Like I would always just do one drawing, like maybe every one or two months. And then after a year, I looked back and then it was like, okay, I only have 10 drawings and I don't like them. So why am I not improving? And then it kind of sunk in like, hey, you don't have to improve like from one painting to the you're gonna improve from one painting to the next but if you do a lot of them and just focus on one problem area like okay maybe you can do perspective but maybe work on your colors next then you can still like you can fuck up 10 color paintings but then the 11th one you're gonna get it right and then you're just gonna move on um so yeah just small steps every day basically just like you said with the dieting it's not gonna you're not gonna change within one but if you just do one small thing every day then like after a year you're gonna be like whoa yeah you're gonna see and feel a huge difference yeah ha habits oh. speak speak so so hugely in in doing anything i think we're out of time for today so i thank you of course for coming on for sharing this project for sharing your experience and your tips i, I deep, deeply appreciate it yeah, definitely. Thank you for having me. This was a nice conversation. Yes, it's good to get in touch with an old acquaintance just on these merits. And, you know, hopefully we can share something with the community or inspire somebody. All in good names. And for you guys that didn't know, and you can follow Simone over here on ArtStation. She's very active on, on Instagram right here. And then she's got a great, a great YouTube channel. So, yeah, go follow Simone. <laughs> All right, then. You have, a, you have a great day and thanks for coming on. You as well. Thank you so much. Guys, thanks for watching. Please hit the subscribe if you want to see more. You can check me out on Facebook, ArtStation, and Instagram. If you want more in-depth content from me, I teach two courses at the CG Master Academy, Architecture Design and Fundamentals of Design. If you want even more learning, you can go to BrushSauceAcademy.com and sign up for one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Join the hundreds of students around the world and start improving your art and design today. If you want to be part of a community, we have Brush Sauce on Discord. We have monthly challenges and hangouts. There are links below for everything I mentioned. Thanks again for watching and take care.